uh, warm welcome to you all. Um, you've joined our, our webinar today to discuss the theme of um, monitoring in of the DHS uh, towards universal health coverage. And we've got an exciting lineup of people there, and, and they, they will be introduced as, as we go along. Um, but just by way of background, we all um, don't need convincing, I think, in this in this webinar that that monitoring and evaluation systems are absolutely central to managing the DHS. They're key to ensuring performance and accountability. And in fact, a learning health system requires, amongst others, good quality information systems. And it's clear um, that we've come a long way in South Africa since the DHIS was developed in the mid 90s. And that's gonna be obvious as we listen to the pres presentations today. Um, we've got institutionalized systems of data gathering and um, and data collation and data communication, but also quite well entrenched um, systems of of review of performance in the district health system. There's um, nowhere in the country where the quarterly and monthly reviews I think aren't happening, um, and so. All of these processes are in motion. We have systems, we have, we have strategies, we have policy, we have processes. But the question is, are these systems still fit for purpose? What are the enduring challenges? So we know that quite a few have been raised over the, over the years. I mean, one of the key issues is the excessive amount of monitoring, um, the the accountability overloads, in fact, in our information system. We have 250 indicators in the in the NIDS. We collect um, information in a variety of parallel information systems. There are multiple reporting processes, some of them poorly connected, um, maybe with some improvement in, in recent time, but you know, the connection between service delivery, for example, HR and financing systems still has some way to go. Um, our digital architectures and capabilities, capabilities are still emerging and face a number of challenges, particularly in the light of a future NHI. And perhaps most importantly, the enduring conundrum of of ensuring that data is used at at the point at which um, practice matters, so it's in management in everyday practice, and perhaps a culture that's emerged of compliance rather than learning. Um, so our question in the next ninety minutes is, what do we? Why is this, and how do we shift our monitoring systems towards Im improved learning in the health system? Um, and we've got this um, very exciting lineup today. Um, we've um, organized this webinar as the South African Learning Alliance for the District Health System. We're a, a recently um, recently established network bringing together um, managers, decision makers, and knowledge workers in the higher education institutional environment. And so we're an increasingly vibrant network of people who are interested in knowledge generation, learning, sharing across the, the academic practice divide. And activities so far have included um, a number of webinars. This is the fourth in a series. We've got a South African Medical Journal series on on the special series on the district health system. We've published six articles and there are a whole lot in the pipeline. We host meetings and workshops. We had a workshop, in fact, yesterday, a national workshop on community-oriented primary care. Um, we have a number of a dozen or so thematic groups in this network, one of them on monitoring and evaluation systems um, in the DHS that has, has undertaken a number of activities and various forms of communication. We're also active in PASA. Um, and in fact, um, a group within um, this network, SALAD, has been applying themselves quite systematically to this question of monitoring and evaluation in the DHS. 
and have published a number of reflection pieces, and there are a number in in currently being developed, one of which will be um, discussed by Peter Barron today. So um, our program today will be ta uh, looking at this issue in, in, more, in more depth. And to do this, we have um, these different pers perspectives uh, reflected in the room. So we're going to have an input from a district perspective, um, uh, Kea um, Haikhanenwe is from the John Taolo Haitsewe district in the Northern Cape, um, in the northeast of the Northern Cape, the one of uh, five districts, I think, in the Northern Cape, bordering Northwest Province and Botswana. Um, its uh, seat, I think, is Kuruman. So um, Kea is a strategic planner in that district and is going to be talking about um, information from a strategic planning point of view at district level. Uh, we're going to have Peter Barron talk about a, a proposal for a district health system dashboard. We're going to have opportunities along the way for you to also um, give input. So we're going to invite you to do that. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Hassan Mohammed, who's who's going to do a panel discussion um, with other players who will he will introduce. So without further ado, I am now going to invite Kea Haikhanenwe, who's the strategic planning manager from from um, John um, Taolo Haitsewe district, uh, just briefly to say Kea is a statistician and she's now in the planning and human space. So she's having to exercise both the left and the right side of her brain and is going to give us a really a good insight on information from that point of view. So over to you, Kea. Thank you, Helen. So I will be doing an overview from a district perspective on the monitoring of the DHS performance towards universal health coverage. Next slide. So the overview of our M&E in the district is such that um, from moving from the left side to the right, we have our facilities, we have our patients, and then as a district, we develop our district health plan, which outlines our aspiration as well as our targets. And then on a day-to-day, -day, um, data is being captured, patients are coming to our facilities, the data then is captured into our systems, which is WebDHIS, Tier.net, um, HPRS, and as well as um, the pharmaceutical system, which is SVS. And then on a quarterly basis, depending on the aspirations in our DHP, we sit with our managers to review our progress towards achieving the goals and outcomes that are stated in the district health plan. And then from the performance reviews, we're able to make decisions as to where the resources have to be, um, if we need to build, um, maintain our infrastructure, if we need to train our managers or our facility managers. Um, and then if that, there's a need for medicine as well as if there's a need for funding. So data is what guides um, our m and &E in the in the district and we use it to make decisions. Next slide. So like I mentioned, in terms of the m and &E process, like I mentioned, on a quarterly basis as per the DHMIS policy, we conduct performance reviews in order to assess what extent a certain program or intervention, whether it has met its objectives, whether we need to reprioritize certain actions. And then what I want to highlight on this slide is that at sub-district level, um, we have facility managers, we have data capturers, we have information officers, we have program coordinators. But at sub-district level, what we prioritize is that we expect facility managers to present. So they'll be presenting indicators as, as outlined in our DHP. And um, if the, the facility manager is not, is not available, then the data flag presents. And then from the sub-district reviews, we conduct district reviews where program coordinators present as well as the sub-district managers. In our case, they are health area managers. Um, and then hospital CEOs also present. And then we also conduct stakeholder reviews. We know that um, the external stakeholders that are always supporting the district. So we hold those reviews and then the stakeholders will present and then we will offer the necessary support. Next slide. 
And then what we monitor is output and outcome indicators outlined in our DHP as power focus areas, as well as the national standardized indicators, indicators that are talking to maternal health, child mortality, immunization coverage. But we also monitor efficiency indicators such as professional nurse clinical workload, patient experience of care, um, PSIs, um, stock visibility system. Next slide. And then how um, does MAE contributes to decision-making? So as a district, we use evidence, the evidence-based approach to ensure that all factors contributing to the achievement of intended results are taken into consideration. And then this approach, basically, it just integrates strategies, people, resources, and then the main aim is to improve decision-making, which also ultimately promotes transparency and accountabilities. And then indicator performance data are next. Right. Um, so in terms of um, decision making, um, some of the indicator performance that assist us when we talk to maternal mortality from the performance of that specific program, we were able then to come up with interventions such as um, whether we need to reach out to our tertiary hospital for the specialist to come down to district level. And then as well as whether the district maternal and child health manager has to come and assist. We also are, were able to see if there's a gap in terms of where we need to capacitate certain key staff such as advanced midwifery, pediatric nurses and theater techs. And then with child mortality, we were able to see that there's a gap and then as a district, we were able to appoint a pediatric um, doctor in the, in the district. And then ideal health facility status is able to assist us in terms of sourcing funds to refurbish our clinics. And then overall underperformance of facilities guides the district executive committee to go out and support facilities with a key focus area of management capacitation. Next slide. And then the challenges in relation to district level M and E. Um, the first one is with regards to the policy. And the policy that I'm talking about in particular is the one of the, um, the district health information management system policy. So this policy was developed in 20, 20, 2011 and to date it has not been reviewed. So it's not accommodating the change in priorities as well as district health system development. And then furthermore, um, the policy does not address the current m &E environment such as the changing DHS versions, as well as the reporting timelines that are now that now have changed. Um, the other challenge with respect to um, district level M and E is with regards to systems. So there has the challenge there is that there has been a shift from the standalone systems to web-based system with cross-platform functionality. And with the district being so rural, um, there is an increase in need of stable network connectivity, which is hard to achieve in deep rural areas. And then lastly, in terms of the challenge, it's talking to facility management. What we're seeing is that ME systems are not considered critical and are not incorporated into daily management decision making. For example, monitoring outcomes on tier.net, um, daily nurse or doctor workload. Next slide. So in, in conclusion, um, just looking at the way the ME system has been operating. Um, what is quite important is that we need to build a culture of M&E within our management structures. As conducting evidence-based evidence health system assessment is critical for management to make informed decisions and allocate resources appropriately. Furthermore, routine M&E through performance review session has sparked program-wide shifts in what interventions are employed and assisted managers to re-evaluate priorities. So we have seen that having quarterly review session is actually um, sort of a team building thing where we all sit and then we review and we're able to advise and share strategies accordingly. So it has sparked a, a, a program-wide um, shift. And then furthermore, using evidence-based decision to make Make informed managerial as well as people related decisions has resulted in better outcomes within our district. However, what is critical is that there's a serious need, like I mentioned, the DHMIS policy was developed in 2011 and today it has not been um, reviewed. So there is a, an important need for this policy to be reviewed so that we bring it in line with the current ME environment, which is geared towards achieving universal health coverage.
And that is the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kea. Absolutely on time. <laughs> A very efficient presentation. So we've got 10 minutes now, and we'd like to invite those of you who, in that space in particular, to share your thoughts with us. Either put up your hand um, or put a comment in the chat. And I don't, um, Hassan, I don't see any comments in the chat. Yeah, there's nothing in the chat at the moment. Thanks. Okay, so maybe I could kick off and just ask you. So you're in a planning function. Um, what, if if you had to uh, design your dream um, information system, you know, what is, what would, what would you want to prioritize? What would be your wish list actually? For an information for a monitoring system in the DHS, I think for me, um, what is important is to first understand the actors that are going to utilize this specific system, and then capacitate those specific actors. Because what I've seen is that we focus on um, the data capturers and the MNE people, the information people, but we're not actually capacitating the operational managers and the clinicians who on a daily basis have to capture this information. So I think if we could make a system that is um, user-friendly to the actual clinician, so that, because now the fear is that this web DHIS is so difficult, I can't even capture. And what we were not realizing is that previously it was paper-based, so we're moving with um, changing systems and environment, but then we're not bringing these key actors along and capacitating them. So I think the main focus should be that, can we capacitate those people that are actively um, on a day-to-day -day involved in this m and &E, on in this DHIS system so that it makes it easier. And it will also um, motivate for ownership of data because now that shifting saying that data is, we're just clinicians, we're just offering um, healthcare services. I don't need to capture, I don't need to be worried whether on a monthly basis data is in line but if you show them that with data you are able to motivate for more resources at your specific clinic with data you're able to understand what is actually happening so i think for me it's just capacitating the key actors and making taking them with as we change the system and not leaving them behind yeah you head in thank you so I see there might, it looks like there might be other things. Hassan, please go ahead. And yeah, so there are some questions in the chat from Krish. Which external stakeholders are invited to MNE sessions? Uh, I don't know whether you want to take them one by one uh, or shall I read out all of them? Um, okay. Um, maybe let me take them one by one. I might yeah. focus. Okay, go ahead. So, so for our district, because it's such a mining town, so we have um, external stakeholders offering mobile services in our community, such as we have the pink drive that is going out. We have um, Vertis that goes out to offer TV HIV screenings. And then there's a few other NGOs as well supporting um, the HAST program. So we have those um, stakeholders coming in, the ones that are going out, um, out, what, what is it called, um, non-facility-based outreach services. So those are the stakeholders that I'm talking about in terms of healthcare services. So we invite everyone that is going out offering healthcare services to come in so that we ensure that there is alignment in terms of the data that they collect and to ensure that it has been captured into our system. Thank you. Thanks, Kia. So uh, a second question, I think Lucy's making a general comment or question to the room to find out if others in the room have similar experiences, achievements, and challenges. Um, do others find the review meetings a valuable process to build shared understanding towards action? Uh, I think that's uh, you know directed at the room as a whole. And then Jean-Marie Tucker asks, "Is I think this is for you, are there specific elements of the DH?" MIS policy that are problematic uh, or is it a matter of a, a need to overhaul the, the policy as a whole? Um, I think it's the whole policy as a whole, especially when it talks to data management as well as data processes. So the, it, with us, the one gap that I can say we're realizing is that the policy is mostly focused on internal 
um, participants in meaning facilities and it's more um, provincial, national level. So there isn't much clearly defined in terms of district level processes and what needs to be followed. And then with us going into the DDC, this, the data flow process is still talking to capturing and sending to another level. So it's data management, particularly and data processes within the policy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll, I know that I see Tulani has his hand up, but let me just ask you one last question from the chat. And this okay. is really just a comment from Cindy Siwe Mabaso. Uh, who says that our data collection systems are mainly manual um, and open to error and negative audit findings. So suggesting a fully implemented electronic patient record might address some of these. Do you want to comment on that? Um, can you repeat that? Sorry, I was responding to a chat question. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So the, the question is really just about our data collection systems are manual, open to error, and negative audit findings. So, you know, will an electronic patient record address some of these? What do you think? Most definitely, most definitely, especially with the issue that um, the next process will be finalized and then the, the printing of the registers will take a while. So in our district, we're finding it very difficult because some of our registers are not in line with the latest needs. So if we go paperless, that it will be quite efficient and it will also reduce the, the expense that comes with printing manual registers. Thank you. Yeah. So, Tulani, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, and thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Mohamed. Uh, my name is Tulani Masfela from the GPME, formerly with NDOH. I also want to, to welcome the presentation. Uh, I think it's excellent, concise, and to the point. I, I have about three comments uh, make you out separate. Um, the, the first one, maybe I must start with a, an admission. Um, I, I, I wrote that the HMIS policy of 2011 together with a, a group of people from the department and um, from his, and the idea was always that um, it will be revised, but also based on a bottom-up process of the type of feedback that you are giving today. You know, so I'd like to find out if NISA, NISA has been receiving feedback from the districts and provinces about, about um, the implementation of the HMS police and the limitations. And also to say, as you've correctly pointed out, the context was different then. I mean, 13 years ago, mostly we were using manual systems for data collection and even the data collection, you know. But now the context has changed. So I think my question is more around whether you are providing feedback to NISA and what has been the response thus far. And then my second and last point is that you make a, an important observation that um, you know we need to adapt and adjust and refine the policy, particularly in the context of two things. One being the new DHS strategy coming, but also NHI. In the context of the impending NHI, whether it happens in the next 10 or 20 years, my question is, maybe similar to what was asked earlier on, which private sector providers are you working with at the moment? Are you ready to purchase? And what, what services would your district or the province be ready to purchase from private sector providers in the district in which perhaps you are working and also where the, the province believes, you know, if it's two or three districts that are ready, what, what services will they be? ready to to purchase i would like to also lastly to to blow the cover of uh, ddg hunter from the NDOH. Uh, she's also here and you know she's the custodian of the work that we are discussing this afternoon thank you very much okay awesome so jeanette <laughs> you're no longer an anonymous participant and we will allow you to say a few things perhaps in the later session we need to move on but Kia, let's give you one minute just to respond to, to some of those thoughts and we can pick up again on them. 
um, okay. after the panel and, and other inputs. Over to you for one minute. Okay, one minute. Um, thank you so much, Tulani, for the questions. Um, in terms of NISA, um, we are not really at district level engaging with them. It's only this year that um, I have started critically looking at the policy. Um, so um, I'm taking note that um, there's a certain process of us giving feedback so that they can be noted. So I will follow that. And then in terms of the NHI and what to purchase, I will comment later on. But thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Kea. So let's move on to our next speaker, um, and that is Peter Barron, um, who I think many of you will know, but Peter's a public health specialist, and he's worked for many, many years in this space with people like Tulani, thinking about the design of systems nationally, um, he worked at Health Systems Trust. He was one of the, or the key architect of the District Health Barometer. We're going to hear more about that later. So, and he's been thinking about this question. He's been convening this m &E group in, in the Salad Network and first authored that paper I showed you earlier. Um, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about his current thinking. So over to you, Peter. Thanks very much, Helen, and good afternoon to the 80-odd people uh, listening to this uh, presentation. I'm going to talk about a proposed uh, dashboard for districts in South Africa based on current realities and not in moving into the future with a possible electronic uh, information system and NHI. So it's really based on the current situation. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is a dashboard that in a typical South African district or sub-district. And the main points that I'm going to make is that uh, our thinking is shaped by um, WHO, World Health Organization, Primary Healthcare Framework. And I'll show you a slides on this later. And then some of the reasons for moving from the WHO framework to a South African dashboard and then um, the criteria that we use to construct our proposed dashboard, and then the 20 indicators that make up our dashboard. Next slide, please. So the next two slides are the WHO primary healthcare framework and indicators, and it's too detailed to go through thoroughly in the time that I have available. So just some uh, main points that I want to make is that this is... Uh, the dashboard that they suggest for monitoring is focused on uh, the health system performance and then the health system capacity, which are the blue indicators, and then the primary health care performance, which are the green indicators. And the headings that they have here are not really indicators. The, the indicators would be uh, bullets under each of these headings. So they have many, many indicators in their dashboard. Uh, and framework, um, and and too many to uh, for every district to use. So, um, just to show people some of the things that they've got in their dashboard under structures, they've got things like governance and leadership. Under the second column, inputs, which are these are some of the building blocks which people will be familiar with, such as the health workforce, medicines, and information systems, and then the two. Um, um, columns on the right hand side are the service delivery um, and the, the processes and outputs and many of the programs that I'll talk about later on fall in under the outputs uh, um, column. Moving on to the next slide, please, just for completeness sake, this is a, to the right hand side of the of the service delivery and these are the higher level outcomes and impact um, of the WHO framework. And the, the indicators under these headings are more suited for uh, an annual review and also for higher levels of the health system, such as the provincial and national level. Thank you. Moving on to slide five. So some of the reasons for moving from the WHO framework to a South African framework is that South Africa has got a unique health system and a unique uh, information system. So the dashboard that we're recommending is 
tailored to the current situation in South Africa. Also, many of the indicators in the WHO framework require special surveys to obtain the metrics, and that's more suited for an annual review than a quarterly review. Then the information system, particularly the DHIS in South Africa, limits what indicators can be constructed. So when you present the dashboard later on, you'll see that there's no indicators on uh, um, non-communicable diseases or mental health uh, um, indicators because the, dash, the, the data is not suitable for constructing indicators that work for those uh, conditions. And then in South Africa, district hospitals form an important part of the district and approximately one third of the budget goes to district hospitals. And we wanted to include indicators for this. And thanks to Jenny Nash, um, who helped me with this. And then for the quarterly dashboard that we focus on here, we wanted indicators that managers can use for decision making within the constraints that are in the system. Next slide, please. So some of the criteria that we used for constructing uh, the dashboard is that it's based on quantitative data uh, and not qualitative indicators. We thought that qualitative is too difficult um, to measure across districts if you want to compare. Secondly, the data is readily and regularly available across all districts in South Africa. Thirdly, the data is likely to be reliable because if it's not reliable, then you've got garbage in and garbage out. There's a fourth point is that there's likelihood that, that uh, the indicators vary on a quarterly basis. There's not much point in having an indicator if it's going to be exactly the same from quarter to quarter. Um, the indicators we suggest don't require special surveys with one exception. And I'll, when I present the dashboard, I'll indicate this. Most importantly, that the, the, the indicators we suggest are, pri are priority and importance to managers, to managers. Then the indicator should be easily understandable to most people working in the system. And we've got one exception to that. Ma again, managers can use the indicators to make decisions. And lastly, um, the criteria that shouldn't be that the indicators better analyzed on an annual basis. And examples of this are a number of community health workers per thousand population, ideal clinic rate or functional clinic committees. So we excluded those kind of indicators from our dashboard, not to say they're not important, but they're probably better done on an annual basis. So the next slide, please. So I'm now going to spend a little bit of time taking you through the 20 indicators that we think are pragmatic, important, and relevant for uh, managers in the current context of uh, South Africa and the current information systems. An electronic information system will change this completely, but it's not available to almost everybody around the country at the moment. So we've categorized the indicators into a number of headings. The first one is finance related, and we've got the per capita expenditure on primary health care, that's excluding district hospitals. So how much uh, money is spent on average per person um, in the district? And then secondly, because of uh, the austerity measures at the moment, we thought it's important to see what people are spending. So the percentage of monthly expenditure um, in relation to the monthly budget. Moving on then to the next heading is leadership. And we thought we needed something to uh, measure patient, the, the responsiveness of the system to patients. So we've got average waiting times because this is an indicator where on average patients are waiting about three plus hours. And I think nobody who's listening to this webinar would put up with that if they had to undergo this kind of uh, treatment. However, it does require um, it's the exception that does require a bit of a survey or a record review to calculate this, but not too onerous. Medicines, we've got the stock out of medicines, which is one of the indicators being currently used. And then we've also got the proportion of patients who are on chronic medicines um, getting access outside of the clinic. So it makes it easier for them to get their medication. 
to measure community involvement, we struggled a little bit, but um, um, this is the, the only indicator that we could come up with at the moment. And this is the, the activity of uh, community health workers. What is their workload at the moment? Next slide, please. So now moving on to some of the programmatic uh, indicators, uh, maternal and child health. We've got antenatal visits before 20 weeks. It's a current indicator. Most of these are current indicators as well. Immunization coverage under one year. The dropout rate from the third uh, DTP uh, um, to the first measles um, immunization. And the children who are PCR positive for HIV at around 10 weeks. All of these are important uh, proxy measures of how well the maternal and child health um, program is functioning. Reproductive health, unfortunately, we have there's no real easy indicator. So we have to use the one that's currently being used, which is a couple year protection rate. And it's the one indicator that not so easy to understand. I'm happy to uh, explain a bit of it in the, uh, in the question time. Moving on to um, HIV. We've got, uh, because it's such a huge problem in South Africa, we've got two indicators here. Um, we've got um, antiretroviral effective coverage, you know, what proportion of people are viral load suppressed. And then we've got the proportion of adults or children who are, who are diagnosed with HIV who, know, who are on antiretroviral therapy. And then the last set of uh, indicators um, we've got TB, we've got drug-sensitive TB loss to follow up, and we've got drug-sensitive TB treatment success. STIs is an important uh, public health uh, issue in South Africa, and uh, infections are increasing across the board. So we've got a male condom distribution rate as our proxy indicator to measure how well we're doing in this program. In moving to district hospitals, we've got three indicators to see um, the performance of district hospitals. We've got the C-section rate. We've got children under five uh, with severe acute malnutrition who die in hospital, the case fatality rate. And we've got the, the bed utilization rate. And I was very pleased to read uh, sometime in the last few days that the Eastern Cape is looking at uh, 19 of the small hospitals which have low bed utilization rates to repurpose those hospitals and declassify them. Um, I've been arguing that for uh, a decade or two. And then lastly, we've got the, in terms of uh, access, we've got the per capita primary health care utilization rate. So these are the set of 20 indicators which act as a proxy for other um, components of the health system. And if managers measure these <clears throat> 20 indicators and take action if there's things going wrong with these indicators, I've got no doubt that the system would uh, improve on a, on a quarterly basis. So that's my uh, story. And uh, over to uh, Hassan and Helen. Thanks for listening to yeah. me. Thanks so much, Peter, and thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is an issue that is not new, grappling with the so-called minimum data set. How do we keep sort of data collection and data management manageable and useful, you know, at the same time? And, and I think you with others have come up with a proposed um, data set. Um, it will be useful to hear from others. Um, but we we have asked two district managers uh, to comment. And we're going to start off with Carabello Segway. He's the acting chief director for the district health system, Bojanala district in the Northwest province. So um, just to kick off, uh, Carabello, over to you if you can respond and just add your own thoughts about this particular issue. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Hassan, and thank you, uh, Peter, very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, just a brief one. I'm not going to go into details. I think we should acknowledge the context 
in which uh, we are operating and we acknowledge that there are many systems in the in the in the in, in, in the country is definitely not optimal because we have a few challenges uh, which is our health systems and monitoring tools are not integrated we've got web dhs hprs tier module agile clinic and all those uh, systems are not integrated and i think here yeah, highlighted even earlier the issue of electronic health records and our mne system is also focused as also highlighted in the article by peter is focused more on outcomes and 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 outputs but it's not really measuring um, the performance of health systems de uh, determinants and 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 processes and 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 some inputs and um um the the, the other issue that that, that is uh, critical that I thought we need to quickly comment on is how we do we strengthen many systems. I think everybody is aware now that uh, we, we, we need to use new digital technologies to make sure that, like I've said, we integrate all this health system, we're able to tri triangulate all this data. And the issue of electronic health records, we know different provinces are at different stages. It is critical. Uh, but I think more importantly, we need to strengthen community participation and social accountability. Uh, uh, because we are not sharing performance information uh, in our communities. Actually, I was also reminded that in our performance reviews uh, from the question that was asked earlier, we've got multiple partners that are actually working with us as district, and they are not part of those performance reviews. So pr probably this will be an opportunity to bring them on. And I'm talking about governance structures, organized labor, or committee members, or councillors and other developmental partners. Uh, so the community as a whole is not part of our performance reviews. And I think uh, forward looking, we really need to, to, to take this opportunity to make sure that we are accountable to our community. The, the other important part is integration of data from the, both the public and the private uh, sector, Hassan. Um, the, the opportunity here is, is that web DHIS already has uh, a database of most of our, our private practitioners and hospitals. And as, as an example, we uh, in the district uh, are, are able to capture data from our mining uh, sector, especially data on art, because we have activated an org unit and we are able to capture that. So I think there's, there's opportunities there for us to, to make sure that we integrate data. Maybe we should start with your, your, your private hospital, uh, mining sector, and 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 follow through as, as as time goes on. And I think the other opportunity is is that 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 we we, we should have is that uh, the the issue of of target setting uh, we, it needs to be uh, reviewed uh, because it can be standardized throughout the different uh, challenges uh, throughout. However, uh, I think those are the main issues that I wanted to share with 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 Hassan and the colleagues. Thank you, Hassan. Oh, great. Thanks so much. And I think, you know, your comment on the community sort of aligns with a question in the chat about, you know, how do we measure the community overall uh, experience? And perhaps we can come back to, to that question. Um, but the, the second person we have to just uh, comment, respond at this point is Zama Titi. And she's from, she's an acting chief director for district health services in the Northern Cape. So Zama, I know you're there. Uh, let me hand over to you. Um, yes, I am here. Thank you, good afternoon, Hassan. I'm not sure, my picture doesn't show well. <laughs> I think it looks like you're on your side, uh, but I think just, just, just go ahead, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, let me first start by reiterating the report presented by Kia. It's a good presentation of our systems and our challenges in the province. However, within the province, because I'll be speaking from a provincial level, there are variabilities in terms of how the challenges and in terms of the effectiveness of the system. The work that has been presented by Pillar, it is an illustration or the, 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 the result of an intentional effort to overhaul the entire system. Because we, we 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 looked into the MNE system and we were trying to 
to understand the value that it is adding and I mean as it is currently it was then but uh, because we, we if you if you listen to her carefully she underscored the sub district level because we thought it you better catch it at sub district level and intervene and at that stage however there are limitations within that we were in the meeting together today with Kia in JTG. I just arrived in Kimberley, and then you can clearly observe the limitations of the skills deficiencies. This is what now she referred to as um, the critical need is to capacitate and empower operational managers and clinicians. So for them to be able to mine this data, to utilize it, to capture it correctly, and ensure a seamless information management system. Um, picking up on the last point that was raised by my counterpart, Northwest, the notion, this issue of customized indicators, which seems to be in, um, something that we need to comply with and there is no degree of flexibility around them. From us, we want, we are, we've been grappling with the idea of self because we have seen ourselves over time. When you look at the trend of our performance, there are indicators which really where we've been, we haven't been doing well, but when you, you listen, uh, police and planning will tell you these are customized indicators. We can't change the target. And then you look and so we have now sought to build our own kind of a report and try and triangulate uh, the information from different sources within the province. We've had um, a multi-sectoral uh, forum where we sat with um, States, States SA and then um, all the other sectors, including home affairs, because we're trying to look, we, we, we want to bring an argument of the fallibility of these targets that we've been giving, but we want to ground them to scientific evidence, not implying that it is not a scientific method, but we are trying to embed our targets from what we know and we are observing over trend, over time within the province. We've got a, a, a district which is Namago with a very different dynamics to others, which almost all the time will be the outlier. Uh, if you compare that with Francis Bard, it also has its own dynamics, uh, which are, are, are different from those of, of, of Francis Bard. And you also get variabilities throughout the year within these districts because of migrant labor and because of cross-border uh, issues. So these are the things that we'd like to factor into the system. In terms of a system working with the private sector, uh, it's something that we want to pick up on quite aggressively through the district health systems reconfiguration and starting to engage with the private sector. We are starting to break walls now that have been limiting to, 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 to enable us to acquire the data. The issue is now uh, we need to have a system that will be compliant with government systems who are working with it through HPRS uh, unit and IT and the, the unit, the national unit to see what system would be intra intraoperable can be used. A question was asked earlier on, if we were to outsource, what systems would we outsource? The issue outsourcing services, it said services. We have started, and coincidentally, we had a, an engagement yesterday with um, uh, the mining sector in one of our districts who are looking to open a private facility. And in our deliberations, it came out clearly that uh, they want to come and um, build their hospital, like, in, uh, like uh, not even a kilometer, like literally meters away from us. But uh, they, 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 it is uh, the value that they bring in terms of their value proposition is they'll be bringing skills for us and bringing in a system that are going to assist us and are com to compensate our system. So they are already looking at what can we purchase from them. However, as they presented them, they presented a very serious challenge, a moral challenge from us 
where because when we looked into the system, I must, however, state that we have not clearly defined the nuances of these contracting models that they were suggesting. But anecdotally, when it was presented to us, we felt that it is a system or it's a facility that is being to pose serious challenge. Uh, I mean, to the a facility that already exists. So it's something, something that we're seriously looking into as a department. So Kia mentioned that the serious challenge that we have is the skills deficiencies among our managers, especially at operational level, in ability for them to mine this data, to utilize it, to quality assure it, and then um, which then results in the province having to go out and really be operational. We have now embarked on a capacity development kind of an intervention, working together with Kumba and Right to Care, Anglo American and Right to Care, to see how can we capacitate them in basic management skills. Uh, another thing that we've done. Sorry, with... Zama, can I just interrupt? I think just from a time point of view, um, we need to kind of Thank move you. on. So if I can just ask you to uh, just complete or finish off your comments. Um, uh, Thank you. Just the from review a time of point of view. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks, Hassan. The review of the um, KPAs of district managers and really aligning them right from district management level to sub-district level has assisted us to really attempt to get a very good picture of the performance and try to get a quality of the information that will be reliable. So um, it's, it's, it's still we are still teething, but we are starting to see the value and the results from that. Thank you, Hassan. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sama. Um, and thank you, Karabela. I think both of you, I think just having people in the system, experience, grappling with uh, m and &E systems, you know, and I think both of you touched on the, the stakeholder issue, the community, Zama, you spoke about the private sector. Yeah, I mean, whose data? You know, who's, who are the stakeholders in this whole m and &E data uh, conversation? I think is a, is a pertinent point for, for us to discuss. Uh, Apologies, from... Hassan. I'm not sure if you'll allow me to make just one short comment on Peter's <laughs> dashboard. Yeah. On Peter's please go, please dashboard. Please one, one short comment if yeah. you don't mind. We, yeah. we, it is our view that, um, that that's a sustainable approach to indicators for the district health systems. They are no, we don't have to change it and spend yeah. money reviewing um input forms and, 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 and registers and spending money. And so it is our view that it is a way to go because it does cover a number of areas, including process indicators. Implicitly, it does speak to them because it would mean that you have to track and make can make some extrapolations around the process indicator themselves. Thank you. Just to confirm you referring to what was proposed by Peter. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. Some positive feedback for you, Peter, on what you put forward. Uh, please let the questions come in the chat. Uh, Jeanette, we are going to get to you, but I, I, I guess just um, before we really get into deep into audience um, uh, input and, and questions, uh, I think I'm going to rather move towards the, our last speaker. Um, and complete that presentation, and then we'll have you know open season on all the presentations, general comments, uh, even if Nolutando's you know presentation is slightly different, but it's related. Um, she's from the Health Systems Trust, um, and we know that the, the Health Systems Trust has um, you know produces the the district health barometer um, on an annual basis. It's constantly being updated and changed. Uh, I believe you have a presentation. So let me just check who's going to share that uh, presentation. One of the key things that we wanted to do with the District Health Barometer was to make the data that's available in the publication more accessible, but in an interactive way. And that's sort of how our dashboard came about. Our dashboard is available on dhb.hst.org.za. This is a landing page of the dashboard and it gives a brief overview um, of the publication. 
The dashboard is modeled after publication, so the indicators are also grouped according to the same sections. The four sections we have are reproductive, maternal, and child health, infectious disease control, non-communicable diseases, and then service capacity and access. Um, for this demonstration, I'll be focusing on the reproductive, maternal, and child health sections. Also, you are able to select the different sections by scrolling down to the lower side of the page um, and selecting the particular section that you're interested in. After clicking um, on the section that you would like to explore, this is the landing page that will um, open up for you. On the left panel, we have a different ways in which our data can be filtered. Firstly, the data can be filtered according to the subsection you're interested in. As I mentioned, uh, we're on the reproductive, maternal, and child health category. So the subsections that are available there are reproductive health, child health and nutrition, maternal and neonatal, and immunizations. And as you move through the different um, subsections, you'll find that um, the different visualizations also change um, as you navigate through the different filters. So as I clicked on child health and nutrition, um, that came up on the right side of the page. And subsequently, for example, if I go to um, maternal and neonatal, then the indicates that are available in that section also pop up. And that indicator, for example, here is the delivery in 10 to 19 years and facility rate. But the other indicators that are available are antenatal first visit coverage, maternal mortality and facility ratio, and the neonatal death and facility rate. So these dialogues get updated as you navigate um, through the dashboard according to the selections that you make. Another way in which you can filter up our data is by using the year. So um, our most current year of data is the one that is the default when you open um, the landing page. However, we do have five years of data available on our dashboard and more years will become available as we produce more additions and we develop the dashboard some more. Another way in which you can filter the data is by geographical region. Here, all the current the provinces are available for selection in the country, as the DHB represents all the 52 districts that are available in South Africa. So if I click on Gauteng, for example, you see that the visualizations also change to reflect that particular province, and then the districts that are available in that province um, are then displayed on the page. Another way um, in which you can interact with this data is that you can actually hide or show the data labels um, for your visualizations. However, this is not the only way in which the, the values or the figures can be shown on the, on the visualizations. You can also see them by actually hovering over the actual graphs or the map or the line graph. The main view of the dashboard reflects the indicator you have selected um, on the filters on the left. So currently we're on the maternal neonatal subsection and we're looking at antenatal first visit coverage. As I mentioned, you are able to change these indicators um, as desired. By clicking on the I button, you then get a definition of the indicator according to the most current version of the NETS. These indicators are based on the 2023 version of the NETS. Now you are able to um, explore the different visualizations that we have available um, on the page. So we've got the district ranking that most people sort of recognize the DHB with. And here we are looking at the Gauteng province and you can see the different uh, districts in Gauteng, City Bank, West Rand, Johannesburg, um, City of Twane, and, and Ekuruleni. So when you click on the view more button, it then opens up a larger display of the graph that you're interested in. Here, you are also able to hide or show your displays from this view, but also you are able to change the geographical region that you're interested in. So currently, we're in Gauteng. If we go to KZN, the visualization changes along with the data labels. And if we go to the Northern Cape, for example, we're able to see the five districts um, available. However, for DC6, for example, um, there's no data that was available for that particular year for this indicator. You can then go back um, to the main visualization, um, the main page, and then you're also then able to view the map, for example. So if you're looking at the map, you are able to also see again the values for the different districts that are available. And if you click on view more there too, 
the map then is displayed in a bigger display. Again, here you can change um, the province that you're interested in and the dashboard is responsive, giving you all the values for the districts, but also the provincial value in the smaller dialog or icon um, on the top left-hand corner. Um, the last available visualization that we have um, are the time trends, which is currently visualized as a line graph. So again, if you click on view more, you're able to see a larger display um, of the line graph of the time trend. The data again showing from the available years from 2018 right until 2022. Again, here you are able to, um, if you would like to just sort of get an idea of what the value actually is or which district it's actually representing, by um, hovering over the different data points, you are able to see that information that it's available for 2021 for the Cape Island and the percentage um, or the rate was 98.4. At the bottom of the visualization, you're also able to see some insights, which are also drawn from the publication. And the great thing about these insights is that um, each of the different uh, chapters in the district health parameter are written by people who are quite knowledgeable um, in the field. And the last feature I'd like to show you on the dashboard is our view data button. By clicking on this, it actually takes you to the HST um, page for the district health parameter. Um, it takes you to the district health parameter page on the HST website. And here are all the different publications for the various years are available. You're then able to select the publication that you're interested in. But more importantly, you are also then able to download the data file that contains all the information and the data that is in the publication. The DHB data file um, pretty much looks like this. I won't go into all the level of detail that's involved, but it's basically um, available with data available for national level and provincial level, and then at the district level. So you are able to go through the various tabs, um, which would include all the information that you're sort of interested in yeah, and you just sort of navigate through the filters um, and you can make your own uh, visualizations or your graphs with the data that's available. And then lastly, just going back to the dashboard, um, some other things we'd like to add in is the ability for users to be able to download um, these graphs if they would like to. But I mean, for now, you can always just sort of take snapshots or screenshots and yeah, obviously credits us and the publication as the source of the data. But we generally do hope that people find this um, dashboard quite interactive. And you know, as it develops more uh, and we sort of uh, work on more iterations of it, we'll welcome any feedback on how we can sort of make it better and what other information ideally that would be helpful in terms of monitoring evaluation needs of the country um, for planning and evidence-based decision-making um, overall. Um, I do hope that people are using it and they are sort of um, liking that it's available not only on your laptop, but also um, available on your mobile as well and on your tablets. It's responsive across different devices. So you can access the data even on the go when you're in the field or in your meeting and you just want to access information quite quickly without having to go through sort of a PDF and a, a whole entire like almost 500 page publication um, to get that information. And yeah, ideally people should just use this for um, for planning, um, for research, and also um, other sort of decision or evidence-based um, planning and management um, sort of needs, um, you know, as they come up. Thank you. We want Thanks so to much, uh, Nolukando, and uh, you certainly took us to the next level with a recorded presentation. I also, also couldn't tell the recorded presentation your time is up, you know. Um, so good move on on your part, but you certainly st stuck to time, and I guess that's the advantage of of doing it that way. But thanks so much, and and yeah, I mean I think the district health parameter is a extremely useful resource for many of us around the country, and you know comparisons important. You know comparing different parts of the country, similar parts of the country, etc. So um, always very um, very helpful. Um, so I think just to We've got until 25 past. I see there's a good conversation happening in the chat. Some questions being answered, some debates happening. 
Um, so, you know, keep that coming. Um, I'm going to kick off and ask Jeanette, if, if you don't mind, Jeanette, uh, but feel free to decline. Uh, but there was uh, <laughs> a proposal early on to uh, to ask you just to to share some of your thoughts and thank you for for being present and attending. Um, are you able to um, and willing to to make some comments, Jeanette? Thank you, Hassan. Yeah, I'm very grateful um, to my schedule for allowing me to attend this. It's important. It's a very important conversation taking place. And thank you to Salad for um, organizing this. So I want to start with Kia's presentation because it was the first. Um, I did uh, write in the chat box, but let me say it again, that Kia is, is, is spot on. It's alarming how few managers in the health sector uh, not just understand the importance of M&E, but the fact that you have to set up an M&E system. And with today's complexities and the vast amount of work that we cover, it has to be electronic. It's almost um, like some people believe um, if they put an indicator in important documents like the department's annual performance plan, that uh, data will fall from the sky for them to be able to tell um, how they're doing. And I do want to say in that regard, I don't know if the universities, um, you know, the Western Cape University of Western Cape used to be strong in this when I first joined the health sector. Do you still offer those courses, the short courses for managers? I know managers these days go on the longer Oliver Tambo and then up here in the north, the Albertina Sisulu um, um, uh, management and leadership courses, which I'm sure includes m and &E. But it's a little bit late. Um, we need to start with uh, junior managers like assistant directors and, and deputy directors. And it would be good to know whether um, those courses in the importance of monitoring and evaluation and the how of that is still well and alive um, with the universities in South Africa so that we can actively, managers like myself at National, start sending junior managers um, to those courses. I do want to say I support um, the proposal made by uh, in Peter's presentation. You know, we, we've been talking about um, less is more for decades now, but we don't seem to do well when it comes to putting it in practice. And I think the those indicators that he has put forward as key, um, I agree with him. So I also agree with what Peter has said about the information we need for uh, non-communicable diseases, but it's not just non-communicable diseases. I'm sure HIV, TB and STI could do better um, with longitudinal patient records. That, that is definitely uh, um, uh, what we need. Nolotandu, who has presented on um, the DHB for HST, has got another presentation that she does um, on behalf of the National Department of Health. And that is how we calculate the universal health coverage indicator. And um, when you look at how this is done and what is available to the HST and the WHO in the country, um, they're responsible for... Uh, calculating that indicator, then you will see the, 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 the weakness, the key weakness in terms of available data uh, with which to um, calculate our UHC index comes from the area of the, the key non-communicable diseases in this country. It wasn't clear for me from uh, Zama's presentation whether they are going to welcome and take the private sector collaboration on board. Um, the, uh, she expressed some positiveness and, and, and then she spoke to, uh, I think, some ethical issue. In that regard, I, I just want to say, I would wish that the Northern Cape um, embrace that collaboration because there could be uh, much learning to and fro um, on the side of government learning about the systems that the private sector could bring in and private sector also learning from what government um, is already doing in that space. And um, when you have a state hospital and a private hospital, I don't really see them 
being in competition because uh, as state service providers, we are not uh, revenue driven. And I mean, until the the NHI kicks in, uh, we, sh we, sh we should allow that col collaboration between, uh, I I'm expressing myself wrongly, of course, uh, when NHI kicks in, collaboration will continue. But as things are, um, we should allow the private sector to continue to put up um, um, the services because it would serve the NHI in the end when there's more service providers in a, in a catchment area. I'll stop there, uh, Hassan. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks so much, Jeanette, and, and so good to hear your views and input, and, and you've actually you know, commented on the full range of uh, presentations. I think one of your comments was about the training aspects, and there have been some comments on the importance of training and capacity building. I think you posed a specific question, I don't know if it was at Kia, about whether these training courses are still being run. I don't know, Kia, or if there's someone else who can perhaps no, no, answer. No, no, that one is actually to you and to Helen. Oh, to me and Helen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and maybe Peter knows, uh, because I'm sure he knows what oh, courses we're talking about. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there were those UWC courses on monitoring and evaluation um, and on health information. Now, I don't know, Helen, do you want to comment on that specifically? Yeah, so I went to school, I think Uta Lemon's online as well, came yeah, to okay, show yeah. in COVID, and the whole continuing education space changed after that. Mm. But, you know, we're constantly asking ourselves how we resuscitate these programs, how to offer them in a more, in in the new mm. virtual uh, edu continuing education world, actually, we do have a master's program in information management at UWC. So that's at a higher level. We mm. it's integrated M&E into our master's program. But I take the point that we need we need to think, I think, quite holistically about uh, strengthening capacity that combines formal training offerings, but also mm. work-based learning around use of information. And I think Kia's point about uh, focusing, we've spent a lot of try and time training health information system managers. We haven't focused enough on the on the players and actors in the system who use information, thinking holistically about the information use environment around them and how to shape it in multiple ways. And, and people have raised, for example, revisiting the performance reviews as, as one element of that and how those are learning spaces or not. Um, so I think that a short course training program is definitely one element of a wider package. Yeah. Thanks so much. Let me give Uta also a chance to to comment on this issue if you see anything you want to add, Uta. Uh, hi, Hassan, and thanks. Thanks, and hello to everybody. No, actually, not really much to add. I fully concur with, uh, with what Helen has said. I mean, we look, we need to look at the space, but it. I think it's very important not to just look at the technical skills, um, but also look at um, information use, as Helen says, who said, who who is using information for what purpose, and how does that then interface with how information is collected for what for what reason? I mean, we've often found that one of the problems is that that managers, but also health information officers, don't know why they're collecting the data they're co they're collecting and where it's going and what's what's ha why, what's happening with it, and therefore all sorts of problems um, creep in. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And just from my side, just to say that our um, you know chief director who's, who's of sick at the moment, Gio Perez, initiated a discussion with UWC about tailor-made courses for, you know, uh, managers within, you know, within the district. So I think speaking to a point made in the in the chat um, about, you know, getting people to use data is certainly, you know, uh, top of mind. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the, the Masters in Public Health programs all around the country that could at a, a slightly higher level, that could also help to, you know, um, fulfill this uh, this kind of role. Um, I think feel free to put up your hand if you have anything more to say. Uh, Carissa, you at some point referred to the Richidse initiative. Do you just want to say um, 
a few words about that. What does the sheet say? Because not everyone is necessarily, you know, familiar with that. Sure. Thanks, Hassan. Um, so, yes, um, Rishetse is a coalition of organizations um, that have come together um, to improve the quality of health services that are provided at both clinics and community health centers. Um, they obviously have a very strong focus on HIV, um, and their goal is to be able to improve art retention as well as to reduce viral suppression. And they're able to do this by um, interviewing patients, um, also community members who might not actively be patients, um, and basically try to understand um, how they experience health services, identify those barriers, and then try to actively engage um, with healthcare workers and health managers at these clinics and CHCs. Um, so yeah, they've been doing some really good work um, over the recent years, and I've shared a link on the chat for others to sort of access their work and their very comprehensive dashboard. Thank you. Right, and I, I think there are some papers linked to this initiative that are part of the, the SALAD um, SAMJ um, series. Uh, another point I picked up in the chat from Klaus, I uh, hope he's still on the call, is this PCAT tool. So it's another way of measuring what's happening in the, the primary care setting. Do you want to say a few words about that, um, Klaus? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Hassan, for the opportunity. Um, so the primary care assessment tool was originally developed in the uh, in the US by Barbara Starfield, but it has since been adapted and validated uh, for use in our country, and has has also been now we we actually busy piloting a version for the African region. Um, as you've uh, correctly shown in that that uh, from Peter showed that diagram with the WHO measuring framework. Um, so the PCAT uh, is, is one of the potential uh, exit interviews that one can uh, do with users or patients that, that um, then describe the agreement with several statements around the domains of primary care, including access, continuity, coordination, and comprehensiveness. But it also has a family and community-centeredness uh, domain and and um, so the most recent version of it is currently uh, has been piloted in 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 a, in a free African countries. The South African district was in Amatole with Jenny, who is also on the call. Um, and we now plan to to use it a bit broader. Um, uh, we now have a project starting in November for eleven African countries. Um, the idea is that that I think that there was also this mention, like the colleagues from HST have shown how that data can be used um, in a visual format to guide managers at district and, 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 and local level, um, how the, the, this data is then uh, showing um, the trends across time. Um, but I, 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 it, it, yeah, I think it, it could offer some valuable uh, insight in terms of how um, users or, or patients within these facilities experience uh, care. So it's, it's a bit more than just a, a typical uh, patient satisfaction survey. It has a, a, a validated um, domains and, and gives a better idea about how the users perceive the, the domains of the primary care service delivery. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to to be contacted if there are more queries around that. Thank you. Right. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Klaus. Are uh, useful for people just to get a flavour of what that's about? And I see in in the chat you've provided a link. Um, for uh, uh, a, a PCAT publication if people want to know more. Uh, so please follow that. Uh, so just to end off um, from my side, just going back to the speakers, in uh, in 47 seconds each, uh, Kia, uh, let me just start off with you. Any sort of last comments that you'd like to make? Um, I think from my side, what's critical is more focus needs to be at um, lower level and capacity, ongoing capacitation of relevant managers is important and data should inform decision making. I just want to end off with that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Peter, from your side. 
Yeah, I want to thank uh, all the people who made very useful points. And just to emphasize that the dashboard that I was proposing is a quarterly pragmatic dashboard based on current for annual collection of data um, and an annual review where you can have a much broader set of uh, indicators. So uh, from the private sector, I've long argued for it and the National Health Act makes provision for the for that to be a requirement. It's mandatory if the departments of health want to get data from the private sector. But we could have a long conversation, but that's my uh, 30 seconds worth. Over. Thanks so much. Carabello? Uh, th th thanks, Hassan. I think I've made a, a few of my comments on the chat box. Uh, just mm. to emphasize uh, as well that I, I, I agree and accept the, the, the proposal by Peter on the dashboard, they seem very realistic. And and I actually wanted to emphasize what you were just saying, that uh, the fact that you'll be reporting this quarterly it is pragmatic and, and, and quite pr practical. So uh, thanks for this opportunity. I think all of us have, have, have learned so much from this uh, webinar. Thank you, Asa. Over. Thanks. Thanks, Karapelo. Um, Zama? Thank you, Hassan. I note and take the advice of uh, Ms. Hunter. Um, thank you. I come. Okay. Uh, Nolutando? Um, yeah, thank you, everybody, for all the great presentations. It's always great to learn more um, about our district health system. Um, I always feel like with these engagements, there's always something new that um, I take from it. And we've gotten some nice comments on our dashboard and also some suggestions of how we could improve it. So we are in the process of developing it some more. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And any other people who might want to engage um, outside of this right. call of this webinar, please do so. Thanks. Open invitation from Nolotando. And by the way, good to hear you live and not just as a uh, recorded voice. Just the last comment that I want to make. Thanks, you know, for all those inputs. I think one of the things Peter touched on was about uh, um, <clears throat> qualitative versus quantitative information. Uh, but I must say in the space I'm working in, the Western Cape, there are more and more discussions about narrative uh, input into MNE. Uh, I know Peter Fields, you know, how do we standardize that? Um, but there are, there is a move or, you know, some people within um, our space at least who are wanting to bring that into our discussions into our reflections um, about performance and not just see this as a purely quantitative exercise. Uh, but on that very controversial point, I'm going to hand back to Helen to close off proceedings. Helen, back to you. Yeah. Okay. So my job is to thank um, the excellent inputs all round uh, from Kea um, Otsepa, Peter Baron, Carabello, Zamakiti, and Olutando Nlovu. Thank you so much for enriching this discussion and for the care you've taken in preparing. So um this webinar was put together by a design team. So Hassan and I are just the facilitators allocated, but actually it was Lucy, Sue, Peter, Caressa, and, and Zianda who who designed, put together, engaged the speakers and made sure that, that we've got a successful event. Um, so just so you know, we will, as with the previous webinars, we are going to make a recording um, and the slides available with a praise um, in the next little while. And we just wanted to tell you in the meantime to that we will already plan the next webinar, which will be on the 2nd of October, same time, um, again on the financing fee, uh, theme that speaks to NHI, capitation-based financing uh, for primary health care learning lessons from the ground up to strengthen the NHI reforms. So watch this space. We will be in touch. And if you want to join our mailing list, those are the addresses. And with that, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye bye. 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 Fantastic. Bye. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you very much. Complex system. Oh, there's a lot of things. <laughs>